may remember uh, at one point in our journey, uh, we briefly explored, uh, we briefly explored uh, some philosophy. And there's been this historic debate on sort of what drives us as human beings. And so, for instance, Plato thought that we were creatures primarily of reason. We're rational uh, creatures. Uh, Aristotle thought it was sort of the end in, in what we do that sort of defines uh, who we are and what we are as, as, as human beings. But it was the Christian theologian, the North African bishop, Augustine, who said, no, we as human beings, we're primarily creatures of desire. We are creatures of affection. So that what defines us as human beings is not necessarily what we think, not necessarily our rationality, not necessarily what we do, but it is what we desire. We're defined as human beings by what we love, what we love. And so uh, sometimes uh, what this means is that if teaching is to have any impact upon people's lives, if it is to impact how we live our lives, generally it's not because we've been aroused by some sort of intellectual thought. But it ultimately comes when our heart is moved and our desires are formed and then direct our lives. I guess I'm giving away my, my own thought in regard to you know, what drives us as human beings. I think it is our desires. I think it's our, our heart. It is what we love. So in the end, uh, what is the purpose of, of, of theology? And, and I probably would be somewhat remiss if I, if I didn't think it, it, it is about the formation of your mind, but I think that really is, is secondary. Um, and I, I, I would say that um, I would hope that theology would lead to how we live our lives. But if you remember, it was the Pharisees who kept the letter of the law. Who kept the letter of the law. Who walked out the letter of the law, but missed the spirit of the law. So in the end, uh, more than anything else, I would hope that this time that we have together, more than anything else, would be about heart formation. That this would be a means by which God forms our hearts and forms our love. Let's pray. Allow the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer, Amen. All right, by way of review, and I'm not going to spend much time talking about uh, the review, but um, what we're really at the heart of the sessions we have together is asking the question, what do we do with this book? What do we do with uh, the Bible? And there are two sort of presuppositions that are key to what I've been doing in our time together. Uh, first of all, it is to recognize that the Bible is not nearly as easy to understand as sometimes we are led to believe. Uh, that it is quite possible to have a sincere heart and to have the Holy Spirit and actually be led in a direction of confusion and falsehood. The Bible is not easily understood. Uh, but the second thought, uh, the second presupposition, which is critical, uh, what do we do with this book? Um, I ultimately answer that question by saying we read it with the church. We read it with the historic church, our sisters and brothers in Christ that scatter throughout the ages. And we read it not only with the historic church, we read it with the contemporary church scattered throughout the world. So the church past and the church 
uh, present. And one of the reasons why we do that is to help us to understand that the Bible was never principally written to you, singular you. That in fact, the Bible was principally written to, and again, you've heard me talk about the superiority of the southern dialect of the English language. It was written to all y'all. All y'all. So in, in Old Testament, New Testament, except for one or two, well, actually a little bit more than a few epistles, uh, all of the books of the Bible are written for believing communities and not to individuals. Meant to be read and interpreted in believing communities. And so uh, what we're sharing is how has the church historically read the scriptures? And we're going to allow how the church has historically read the scriptures to guide our reading and interpretation of the scriptures. And so the purpose of theology historically is actually to set individuals free then to read the Bible and make sure they don't misinterpret the Bible, at least on its major, on its major points. So um, one of the things that we've been doing is we've been doing the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed is probably the earliest formal creed in Christianity outside of the New Testament. And it is a creed that has been confessed uh, throughout the centuries of the church, across time and across geography. And the beautiful thing about the Apostles' Creed is that it's a summary of the Bible. It begins in Genesis 1, ends in Revelation 22. That's not by accident. It is a summary of the Bible. The very words of the Apostle Creed come straight from the Scriptures. So it's not only a summary of the Bible, but it's also, as you work your way through the Creed, sort of like what we've been doing, is that you work your way through Christian theology, the basics of what we believe as Christians. You may remember I also said to you that the Bible can be summarized in five narrative points. And these five points, these five points are a summary of Christian theology as well. These are the five points of Christian uh, doctrine as well. So, if I could see you, please hear me. I am not one of those professors that believes that you remember everything that was said and discussed in the last class, especially when that last class was two months ago. I don't even expect my students who have me three times a week to remember from class to class what we discussed in the last class. (laughs) But, so, if you would, if I could just see your hand, if you're right-handed, let me see your right hand. If you're left-handed, let me see your uh, left hand. And let's see if we can can remember. See if we can remember. I could could, uh, actually, uh, my my, my student here, uh, Chad? Yes, Yes, Chad. Chad. yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I just have Chad right now in Theology 101. I could really put him on the spot here because this is something he should know uh, by this time. He doesn't look worried, does, does he? Okay, but uh, I'm going to ask Chad to help lead us out. If you can remember uh, what those five points are. Okay, what's the first point? God. God. Oh, very good. Creation. Creation. Fall. Fall. Redemption. Redemption. Consummation. Now, he's well on his way to doing really well on his first test in in Theology 101. Yeah, Uh, let's say it together again. God, creation, fall, redemption, consummation. One more time. God, creation, fall, redemption, consummation. So this is what we've done so far. We've done the doctrine of God. We've done the doctrine of creation. We've done the doctrine of the fall. And um, we're about to conclude the doctrine of redemption, and we will be culminating with consummation uh, today. So, uh, let's go ahead and jump right into it, and uh, we're picking up the discussion of redemption. At the very end of our last session, we talked about Jesus Christ. We talked about his incarnation, his life, death, resurrection, and his exaltation to the right hand of God in his humanity. And in his exaltation to the right hand of God, you will remember that 
the eternal Son of God in the incarnation is given the name Jesus, which means the Lord saves. And he is given the title Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. And in the Old Testament, the prophets talked about the one who would come and not be a Messiah, because there are a number of anointed ones in the Old Testament. Prophets, priests, and kings are Messiahs. They're anointed ones in the Old Testament. But the Old Testament prophets began to talk about one who would come and not simply be a Messiah, but one who would be the Messiah, who would actually take all of the Old Testament offices, prophets, priests, and king, prophet, priest, and king, and bring it together in one person. And so the incarnate Son of God, Jesus, is not a Christ, he is the Christ. He is the, the Christ. And so, how, what is the work that Jesus does? Everything that Jesus does is done under the office of prophet or priest or king. But right now, he is operating in his office as king. He's exalted to the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. But it's in his royal office at the right hand of God that brings us to this point that I want to begin with this morning. And that is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Because according to the prophets in the Old Testament, what the Messiah will do is that he will send the Holy Spirit. He will send the Spirit of God. And of course, that's what happens on the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost. So, uh, let's talk about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. In the Apostles' Creed, we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. If you look carefully at the Apostles' Creed, you will see that the preposition in, I in, only occurs three times in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, in the Holy Spirit. That's not by accident. Our faith, our trust, our confidence... Our obedience is directed to the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When we talked about the doctrine of God, we briefly talked about the Holy Spirit. So let me take a few moments and talk about uh, the Holy Spirit. We recognize that the Holy Spirit is not the first person, not the second person, but the third person of the Trinity. Do I hear an amen? I want you to know that is not by accident that we even number the members of the Trinity. How many of you have ever noticed, if I say the first person of the Trinity, who would you say? Father. If I said uh, the second person of the Trinity, who would you say? Son. And so the third person of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. And there's a reason why we even order the names. How many of you remember the baptismal formula? Baptized in the name of the? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, the reason why uh, that is has to do with the internal relationships of God. So we recognize that the Father eternally is the source of the Son. He eternally begets the Son. Do I hear an amen? Eternally. Okay, so Father, source of the Son. So Father first, Son second. Now please hear me. This is an ordering of source and not importance. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are equal persons. But this has to do with the internal relationship that exists between them. The Father eternally begets the Son. And then we recognize what Scripture points us toward is the fact that the Father and the Son from all of eternity breathe or spirate the uh, Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Let me just ask you this. Is that at least you can put the connections on why we have the ordering that we do. The Father eternally begets the Son, and then the Father and the Son eternally spirate or breathe the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we recognize that the Spirit is fully God. In other words, whatever the divine nature is, whatever it makes God, God, the Father has that nature, the Son has that nature, and the Spirit has that nature. 
And whatever the attributes of the divine nature are, the Father has those attributes. Omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence. Uh, whatever attributes of nature that the Father has, the Son has those, nat- that has those same attributes, and the Spirit has those attributes. That, here's the equality of God. I mean, the Father is omnipotent, the Son is omnipotent, and the Spirit is omnipotent. Uh, The Father is omniscient, the Son is omniscient, the Spirit is omniscient. Uh, The Father is omnipresent, the Son is omnipresent, the Spirit is omnipresent. In regard to what they are, they share. They all have it. Not unlike the fact that everybody in here is human. And because we are human, we share some of the same attributes. Do I hear an amen? To varying levels and degrees. We all share attributes of what it is to be human. The difference between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is not in regard to what they are. But it is in regard to who they are. It has everything to do with person. So, let me ask this question again, trying to help us to think along these lines. Don't take this too literally, though. I'm going to ask the question, what are we in this room? What are we? We're humans, aren't we? Do I hear an amen? We're human beings. That is what we are. Now take a moment, turn to your neighbor, and just reintroduce yourself. We're not asking the question now of who, but we're, I mean, we're not asking the question of what, but we're asking the question of, of who, or uh, for those of you who are grammarians in here, not uh, the question of whom. I do know my grammar, even if I don't always use it. But we're asking the question, who? Um, would you take a moment and turn to your neighbor and tell, tell, tell your neighbor who you are, even if you already know each other? You, you know each other. All right. So, so the difference among you is not difference in nature, but it's difference in person. It's not in the what, but it is in the who. And so we see the same thing in God, a Father, Son, and a Holy Spirit. They're the same in nature, but they're different in person. So they have personal attributes that only belong to the distinctive person. So, uh, let me ask you this question. Turn around and answer this uh, to your neighbor. Who alone among the divine persons is eternally unbegotten? Eternally unbegotten. Who is eternally unbegotten? Take a moment. Turn to your neighbor and answer that question. Who alone is eternally unbegotten? A uh, hint here, because I'm, this is the first question I'm asking. This might deal with the first person of the Trinity. Yeah, uh, the Father alone is unbegotten. Uh, who alone has the personal attribute of being eternally begotten? Second person of the Trinity here, hint, hint. All right, now let's say this out loud. There's only one person left in this list. Who alone is eternally spirated? The Holy Spirit. Hence, that's his name. Uh, Why is the Father called Father? Because for all of eternity, he has begotten a son. Uh, Why is the Son called Son? Because he's been eternally begotten by the Father. Why is the Spirit called Spirit? Is because for all of eternity he has been spirated or breathed by the Father and uh, and the Son. All right, so brief review of the doctrine of the Trinity. So the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity because he's been breathed eternally, spirated eternally by the Father and the Son. Now, let me take just a moment and talk about Uh, The church arrived at this understanding of the Holy Spirit based on the testimony of Scripture. So, uh, first of all, let's talk about the deity of the Holy Spirit. Because the deity of the Holy Spirit is not nearly as clear as we might be led to believe. At least with the Son, there are statements that clearly declare the Son as God. But I will tell you, you will not find anywhere in the New Testament a clear statement saying that the Holy Spirit is God. At best, the closest we get 
to the New Testament saying that the Holy Spirit is God is Acts chapter 5. Ananias and Sapphira. You remember, they sold their land. And they came and brought their proceeds of the sale to the disciples. But they kept some back. You remember this? Just by the way, I am glad that uh, some people want to return to the church uh, in the book of Acts. I'm not necessarily one of them. Um, uh, by the way, um, and I think maybe I've shared this with you before, uh, we, we talk about you know, the book of Acts, the church there, being some sort of pristine beauty. Uh, read closely. Um, so, for instance, that, that, that church in Acts chapter 2 that we all want to get back to uh, was a racist church. They didn't want to have anything to do with the Gentiles. How many of you remember in Acts chapter 6, there was a fight that broke up in the cafeteria? Sounds just like the church. I'm a, uh, not, not that we do that here, but sounds like churches I've been a part of at, at times and in, in places. And I, and I don't want to go back um, to God striking people dead uh, for uh, giving 95% of what they earned to God. But, but fine, there's a little bit more going on in that. Poor, poor, poor attempted humor. But in Acts and Sapphira, this is as close as we get to a declaration that the Holy Spirit is, uh, is God. Um, Acts chapter 5, uh, you will remember, uh, they come and bring the proceeds. They keep some back. And you may remember, this is, is, is what Peter says to them. You have not lied to humans. You've not lied to man, but you have lied to the Holy Spirit. You have lied to God. That's as close to the clearest statement, declaration, that the Holy Spirit is God. But there are other passages of Scripture that help us to, to fill this out. Uh, one of the things is, is that we see, especially in some of the benedictions at the end of Scripture, and benediction is a form of prayer, that the Holy Spirit is included in the benedictions. In other words, the Holy Spirit is prayed to. We see that the Holy Spirit is mentioned in the baptismal formula, in the name, singular, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so that somehow the Holy Spirit shares in the name in the same way that the Father and the Son share in that name. We also see in a couple of places where, in fact, the Holy Spirit is called Lord. Lord in the same sense that uh, God is called Yahweh, which is translated into the Greek as kurios, which is translated into the English as Lord. Uh, you know it. H how many of you remember um, Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God, Elohim? And then we get to uh, Genesis chapter 2, and it says, the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim. But how many of you memorized, you remember it says Lord God, that same word, Lord there is the same sense in which the Holy Spirit is called Lord in, in the New Testament. So that he is Yahweh, he is Adonai uh, a, a, as well. So there is this sustained argument that we see in Scripture implicitly telling us and leading us to believe that the Holy Spirit is God. But maybe the biggest issue is, is the Holy Spirit just an attribute of God? Or is the Holy Spirit, or is the Holy Spirit truly a person? But if you read carefully the New Testament, you will see that the Holy Spirit is clearly portrayed as a person. Uh, you may remember, I, I just mentioned to you Acts chapter 5. Uh, and Isis and Sapphira are accused of lying to the Holy Spirit. How many of you realize you lie to a person? You don't lie to some sort of impersonal nature. You don't lie to an attribute of God. You lie uh, to a person. Uh, we also see that Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that the Spirit gives gifts as he wills. As he wills. Uh, you may remember uh, Jesus said in John chapter uh, 16 that when the spirit of truth comes, please hear me, this is what Jesus says, he will guide you into all truth. Now, what's really interesting here is that Jesus, in fact, 
refers to the Holy Spirit using a personal masculine pronoun. Now, what's interesting about that, please hear me, I'm not trying to say God is male here, but what really is interesting in this is that in Greek, uh, the word for spirit, you know this, is pneuma. And usually in Greek, the pronoun is always going to agree with what it's modifying in gender. Many of you know Spanish, you know these, these sort of things. Uh, gender. And so you would expect Jesus to use the impersonal pronoun in reference to the Holy Spirit, it. But he refuses to do that. He intentionally, he doesn't want this confused at all, that the Holy Spirit is not impersonal, but in fact, he is personal. And so in the Greek, it is he. I'll toss. He will lead you and guide you into all truth. All right, so uh, through our serious study of Scripture, I'm talking about the church's reflection. They believed in the deity and the person of, uh, of the Holy Spirit. Now, what is the work of, of, of the Spirit? It is to complete the work of the Father and the Son in the work of redemption. So, let me say this. The Son, the Father through the Son, the Father through the Son objectively accomplishes salvation. Objectively accomplishes redemption. And we talk about all that the Son accomplished in our last session. So it is the Spirit's work, the Father through the Son in the Holy Spirit, the Father through the Son in the Holy Spirit, subjectively brings about everything that the Father through the Son objectively accomplishes. So if you think about the Father and Son, would you say this word with me? Objective. Objective. And the work of the Spirit is subjective. Subjective. He subjectively applies what the Father and Son have objectively accomplished. And he does that in you, he does, he does it in us, and he does it in all of creation. In all of creation. And we're going to talk about this. What the Spirit has begun. And bringing about what the Son objectively accomplishes is going to be brought to culmination in. What's our fifth point? Consummation. All right, so that's the work of the Spirit. Now, uh, let's talk about the doctrine of the church. All right, I'm going to pause just for a moment. or I'm going to talk uh, too much which I'm prone to do to try to finish this today. But um, if you would, uh, turn, turn your neighbor, just based on this brief discussion of the Spirit, what would be a question or an insight or one thing you would agree with or maybe something you find sketchy you'd push back against? It's a way of processing what we've talked about. Take a moment. What for you would be a question or maybe an insight or something you, you know, I agree with that. Or maybe something you disagree with. Share with the neighbor. Let me have your attention again. Thank you. I'm hearing some great comments uh, taking place or from what I could overhear. Uh, my uh, Tamara, uh, who's right here in front, has, uh, has, has told me that in my old age, I'm losing my hearing. <laughs> I'm losing my hearing. But I, I was able to hear some really great comments uh, uh, taking place. Uh, my father, who's now deceased, he, he died uh, when he was 90, um, he, he said, no, what I have is selective hearing. Uh, selective hearing. All right. Um, let's go on and let's press on to the next part of the creed. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. The Holy Catholic Church. I'll take just a moment to talk about that word Catholic uh, that is there. Please know that it has nothing to do with the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, also know as well that the word Catholic is a biblical word. But you're not going to see it in the English. It's a biblical word in the original Greek text. And it's found in Acts chapter 10. In which the, uh, in which the writer of Acts, Luke, talks about the church according to the whole. That's literal. Here, here it is in the Greek. See if you can hear it. Kataholos. It's a prepositional phrase. Do you hear it? Kataholos. How many of you realize, so Catholic 
is a transliteration of the Greek prepositional phrase according to the whole. Kataholos. Kataholos, according to the whole. So um, Luke is making a distinction between the local church and the church according to the whole. The local church and the church according to the whole. The Catholic church. And hence we talk about the church universal. The word universal is the word for Catholic. And some apostles create it because they know the confusion that's associated with this good biblical word. Uh, and they will translate it and say the, uh, the holy universal church. But that's not a bad translation. It's just but, but the need to try to keep people from falling into confusion o- over the word. So think about the church local and the church universal, the church uh, Catholic, the holy Catholic church. So let me begin by saying this. It's not by accident in the Apostles' Creed that the first thing that's mentioned after God, I believe in God the Father and in Jesus Christ His only Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit. It's not by accident that the very first thing that is mentioned after God is the church. Now why is that? Because next to God, the most important thing in all the universe, the most important thing in all of creation is the church. You might look at it this way. When God brings the universe, the created order into being, what did God have in mind? What he had in mind was the church. Everything that is associated with creation has the church in mind. And to help you to see this more clearly, it's not by accident that the Bible begins with a marriage. As a matter of fact, the culmination of creation, especially if you read Genesis 1 and 2 as a whole, the culmination of all of creation is a marriage. Amen? It's a marriage that takes place between the man and the woman, between Adam and Eve. You remember this? That's how it ends. The creation account is with a marriage. It's not by accident that the Bible begins with a marriage, and it's not by accident that the Bible ends with a marriage. You see, that first marriage is a sign, thinking of what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, the word in Greek is a mysterion, a mystery, a sacrament, a sign. So marriage in Genesis chapter 2 is a sign of the marriage that takes place at the end of human history. Hence, how many of you have noticed that this word consummation is a marital term. Uh, We did talk about this, I think, in our first session. So consummation is really talking about sex. Can we talk about sex? Uh, No, it's, it's about the sexual union, isn't it? The ultimate sign of union between a husband and a wife. And so we talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb, the ultimate consummation that takes place between Christ and what is the bride of Christ? It is the the church. And then it also talks about not only the consummation that takes place between Christ and the church, but the consummation that takes place between heaven and earth. This union, consummation of all things that will take place. And so, uh, as I mentioned maybe in the first or the second session, an Old Testament scholar, former president of Asbury College, a man by the name of Dennis Kenlaw. Uh, Dr. Kenlaw 
uh, said that when God brought the universe into being, he was looking for a bride for his son. He was looking for a bride for his son. You may also remember, I said to you, how important the identity of God is. The most important question in theology is, who is God? Not what is God, but who is God? And at least the Christian answer to the question of who is God is God is, say it with me, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not all the names and titles of God in Scripture are equal. Some are more important than others. So we make a distinction between the primary names of God, the secondary names of God, and the ancillary names of God. And so uh, one of the things that helps us to realize is that the primary name of God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if we take that seriously, what that means is that more fundamental to God being king is God being Father. More fundamental to uh, their... uh, More fundamental to their being a kingdom is their being a family. More fundamental than our being citizens and servants is our being children, daughters, and sons. And so it's not by accident, again, that the language that is given to us in the opening chapters of Genesis is not royal language, but it's familial language. And it's not by accident that when we get to the end of Scriptures, The dominant language that is given to us is not royal language, but it is familial language. The church is the goal and the end of creation. I cannot tell you how important to the purposes of God the church is. The next point is, uh, it forces us to ask this question, doesn't it? If the church is so important, what exactly is the church? What exactly is the church? It may not be what you think it is. Um, Can I give you a a definition of church? This is sort of a consensual definition. If you read different articles of religion, confessions of faith, statements on what is the church, this is what we would call the nature of the church, what is, is the church? Let me give you an answer. Uh, The church is the body of Christ. It's the body of Christ. And so if the church is the body, then what is the head? It's Christ. The body of Christ. Christ is the head. Uh, What this means, theologically, is that you can make a distinction between the two, but you can never separate the two. You can make, please hear me, don't confuse the body with the head. Don't confuse the church with Jesus. And don't confuse Jesus with the church, but make no mistake, they are inseparable from one another. They are inseparable from one another. So, what does that mean? Do you know... What it means is that we need to treat the church with reverence. What do I mean by that? Reverence, respect. Uh, Think with me for a moment, my beloved here. Um, How many of you realize that it's quite possible for me, quite possible for me, uh, to be kind to you, to treat you with some sort of respect, even if you disparage And tear down my wife. I mean realize it's capable for me. But how many of you realize it's impossible for us to be close? It's impossible for us to be close. This is my beloved. Now. She would say this about me. I'm hardly Jesus in this relationship. I'm hardly Jesus in this example here. But let me just simply say, and my wife would admit this, that she has her own quirks and idiosyncrasies. (laughs) Let me put it kindly. (laughs) But she is my beloved. We, please hear me, isn't 
that we shouldn't ever critique the church? Does it mean that we can't point out the flaws? But it better be done in love. And what I mean by love is for the perfecting to take place. So uh, all of this to to say that uh, the church is the body of Christ. And it's it's inseparable from, from Jesus. It's inseparable from Jesus. And uh, even what we see in consummation, in some sense, we're already living out even now in relationship to, to the church. Okay, so the church is the body of Christ, made up of followers of Jesus, mystically joined together. And what I mean mystically joined together, joined together by the Holy Spirit. But here's the kicker that you need to take note of made concrete in made concrete in local congregations a question is often asked is it possible to be a part of the church universal the body of christ without being a part of the church local at least from a biblical perspective and a historic christian perspective it's impossible That in matter of fact, you, the way that you conceive of the body of Christ, when Paul is talking about the elbow and the arms and the, and the knees, and he doesn't use that language, but you know what I'm talking about. The way that we as Westerners have a tendency of reading that passage of Scripture is that Paul is talking about us as individuals, but I want you to know Paul doesn't have individuals in mind. He has local congregations in mind. House churches in mind. And so, uh, I'm not speaking about the ultimate salvation of people or whether they're Christians or not, but I will say this, from a historic Christian perspective, there is no being a part of the church universal without being a part of the church local. So the body of Christ, made up of of followers of Jesus Christ, mystically joined together um, by the Holy Spirit, made concrete and local churches. And it's through this body, these local churches that make up the body of Christ, is where God is primarily at work in the world today. Think with me for a moment. How many remember in the ministry of Jesus, if you had to think about where God was primarily working and acting in the world, it was in and through the earthly ministry of his son. Do I hear an amen? You see that. And I will tell you in a very similar way, the way that God is primarily working and moving in the world is in and through the church. So it's through this body that God is working and moving in the world. Please hear me, the hope of the world is Jesus Christ. But it's not apart from the church. It's not apart from the church. Because the church is his body. All right, so mystically, the primary means of God's grace in this world. Now, how do you identify a local church? How do you know that the local church is truly a part? Of the larger church, the church Catholic, the church universal, it has three marks. There are three marks uh, to any local church that can be used to distinguish whether or not it's a part of the body of Christ. First of all is the preaching of the pure word of God. Sound doctrine is preached, sound doctrine is taught. Second is the due administration of sacraments. Or ordinances. Baptism and Holy Communion. At least bare minimal. And third, it's where the community is rightly ordered. In other words, church discipline is exercised. Please hear me, that discipline, we don't like discipline. But what we mean by that is redemptive discipline. And so the church exercises redemptive discipline among its wayward members. I don't know if you remember this, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there is a man in the church who is sleeping with his father's wife. You remember this? And uh, the Apostle Paul says that that person needs to be excommunicated from the church. Why should that person be excommunicated from the church? Uh, Because so that person can come to their senses 
and ultimately be redeemed in the end. Come to a place of repentance. That is the exercise of discipline. The community rightly ordered. But uh, this is the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It's a very short chapter if you get a chance to just read it this evening. It's a fascinating passage of Scripture. Short chapter. But here's how 1 Corinthians chapter 5 ends. (laughs) We need to remember this. Paul is very clear, you and I don't judge the world. We don't judge the world. Why? They don't know any better. They're lost. How else would you expect someone who walks in darkness but to walk in a way that is blind? Paul says we don't judge the world. We don't look down upon the world. We have compassion for the world. It's lost. Because it's lost, how would you expect anything else? But Paul goes on to say, we do judge the church. And we judge individuals in the church. Now, why do we do it? Ultimately, For redemptive purposes. Not punitive reasons. But redemptive reasons. That's the exercise of discipline. Now, uh, we've sort of thrown all restraints and constraints within the body of Christ. And um, where in the world is is discipline within the the, the body of Christ today? Uh, I, I think this is one of the... Areas that we're really challenged in in any time. Uh, here, here's the problem, isn't it? And I know I have some old-time Wesleyans in here. When I say old-time, not that you're old, but you, you, you have spent some time in the Wesleyan church. And let me tell you, uh, legalism is not redemptive discipline. So uh, the problem is, is that we've had, we've had uh, legalism and at times uh, discipline exercised Not redemptively, but punitively. And so what has happened in response to the the wrong use of authority in the church is that we've dropped it all together. So we've gone from one stream to the other extreme. Just to let you know, John Wesley talked about the via media, the, the middle way. Somewhere. Uh, you know, between the two. But please hear me, any discipline is ever exercised in the church. It needs to be exercised, but it's always in the end of love. And the purpose is repentance, amendment of life, and reconciliation. That's the end of it. All right. So the preaching of the pure word of God, oh, the due administration of the sacraments, the community rightly ordered, the due administration of baptism and holy communion, although the Wesleyan church is sacramental, not ordinance-oriented. Can I just pause just for a moment to talk about how important, how important baptism and Holy Communion are? Can I talk just for a moment about how important baptism and Holy Communion are? Why they are so important? Why they are so important? Why they are so important? And it has everything to do with the fact that you and I, as human beings, we are embodied souls. We're not souls without bodies. We're not bodies without souls. We've talked about this. As a matter of fact, there's, uh, there's this wonderful word I tried to teach you at some point along the way, anthropine. Would you say that word with me? Anthropine, the art of being, the art of being human. The art of being human. And so, uh, let me just say this. The preaching of the pure word of God, sound Christian teaching, it touches our souls. It touches our rational souls. It appeals to our minds. But how many of you realize you're more than a mind? You're hearing amen? You're also a, take a moment, touch yourself, don't touch your neighbor. Touch yourself. You're also a a body. You see, words are signs. They're not the reality itself, but they point us to the reality. So if I say the word Jesus... How many of you realize that word is not the reality, but it's pointing us to the reality? Amen? Those are what are called verbal signs that communicate to our minds. What I'm doing, everything I'm doing right now is communicating to your minds. 
But we are more than minds, we're also bodies. And so let me tell you this, as a human being, you need a physical sign. Not just a verbal sign, but physical signs. Again, let me try to illustrate this uh, for you. I'm an embodied soul. And so as a result of that, I need both verbal and physical signs to communicate holistically to me. So I come to this because uh, I could ask Tamara, uh, what do I do? Uh, I I need for my wife to say to me, Chris, I love you. I need to hear those words. But I need more than just those words. I need not just a verbal sign, I need physical signs of that. And so uh, I'm only saying this, uh, honey, what do I do uh, when I sense that you're angry with me? What do I do? I need not just a verbal sign, I need a physical sign that communicates that love to me, to my soul, to my rational mind, and to my body. Um, My father, I just mentioned to you, passed away. Uh, My dad, very rarely in the course of the 50 years I had him, very rarely did he ever say, I love you. Very rarely did he ever say, I'm proud of you. I, I only occasionally heard that from him over the course of my life. But my dad, even though I I, I knew, at least in my mind, that my dad loved me, do you know, uh, my dad never initiated a hug with me. Never initiated a hug. When my dad passed away, this is seven years ago now, when my dad passed away, I knew that my dad loved me. And yet, there was something missing. And it remains a hole within me in regard to my father. I know but there are questions. The preaching of the pure word of God is the gospel to our minds. The reason why we have sacraments and ordinances, baptism and holy communion, how many of you remember baptism and holy communion is all about the gospel and what it physically represents? Do I hear an amen? And it touches our bodies it communicates to our bodies so holistically we need not just the preaching of the pure word of God Uh, we need baptism and holy communion these physical signs that speak to the fullness of our humanity some of you already know this some of you uh, please hear me whether you appreciate it or not uh, you need baptism and you need holy communion And you've gone through baptism and Holy Communion and wondered, I'm not sure I really needed that. Some of you, though, because let me just say this, some of us are more verbally driven and some of us are more physically driven. The more verbally driven tend to move towards the preaching of the pure word of God. Those of you who are more physically driven tend to move towards more sacramental traditions, more physical, ritualistic traditions. Just real quickly, how many of you in here, how many of you are primarily verbally driven? How many of you, you'd recognize you're primarily verbally driven? How many of you, though, you know that you're primarily physically driven by physical signs? That's the purpose of God. Let me just say this. This is the reason why John Wesley believed that the sacraments could be a converting grace. Just as powerful as hearing the word of God is feeling the word of God. And so I will know you, I'll let you know over the course of my life and ministry, I've known people who found Jesus as they were taking Holy Communion. I've had people who have found Jesus even as they were going down into the baptismal waters and coming out of the baptismal waters. It's because we're human, my friends. We're human. Anthropine. So, preaching of the pure word of God, sacraments duly administered, community uh, rightly ordered. All right. Marks of the church. 
if you would take uh, just a minute at your table, and just based on what we've said about the church, what would be a question or what would be an insight or one thing you would agree with or disagree with and share with a neighbor? Question, insight, something you'd agree with or disagree with and share with a neighbor. Let me have your attention again. I'd love to spend some time. I Believe it or not, we're going to try to wrap all of this up in the next 15 minutes. We're going to try. Chris Bounds is going to try. <laughs> all right. Next in the Apostles' Creed is the forgiveness of sins. I want you to know, notice the placing of salvation. The forgiveness of sins is the discussion of salvation. Know that it doesn't come before the church. It comes after the discussion of the church. I mentioned to you that the church is the, uh, is the bride of Christ. Amen? How many of you know that it takes two to make a baby? I hope you know that. You're old enough to know that. Uh, it takes two to, uh, to, to make a, 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 a baby. Please hear me. I'm not saying people can't be and are not saved apart from the church. It does happen. But the church is the primary means. By, what, by which people are brought into the kingdom. They're born again into the kingdom. They are conceived and birthed and nurtured and brought to maturity in and through the church. So I want to be clear that it's not by accident yeah, because I, I will say this, that some people will put salvation before the discussion of the church. And I would tell you that would be to miss the whole point of Scripture. No, the, I, I say that with great trepidation. I, the person I studied with was a man by the name of Tom Oden, who his big emphasis was on classical Christianity. I've been heavily influenced and impacted by him. But if you read his systematic theology, he places the discussion of salvation before the church. Can I say this to you, Dr. Oden? You're wrong. I say that humbly to you. He's dead now. <laughs> He's gone on to be a part of that community of witnesses, cloud of witnesses. But it's not by accident. So uh, let's talk about then the experience of salvation in and through the church. And so to do that, the way that I'm going to talk about it is to talk about sin and the biblical metaphors of sin. Now, the reason why this is important is because the Bible has a number of ways in which it talks about and describes sin. And all of these are important. Again, one of the problems that we have is that certain traditions within Christianity have a tendency of focusing sort of on one metaphor to the exclusion of the other. But you need all of these major metaphors to give us a holistic understanding of what the problem of sin is in our life. And the first metaphor, which is the one that we all know so well, is the legal metaphor of sin. So the scripture will use this sort of language. Sin as a trespass, as a transgression, as a violation of the law of God, the breaking of the law of God. And sin is indeed that. But it is so much more than that. And so you have these legal metaphors by which sin is described. But then you have what are also called the familial, family, relational metaphors of sin. So seeing sin as being unfaithful, irreligious, the practice of injustice, dishonor. This is all language for sin as well. But it's not on the legal level. It is on the relational and familial level. But sin isn't just legal and it's not just familial. Uh, but it is also, uh, it draws upon, the scriptures draw upon um, images and words that come from the temple that come from worship. Cultic literally means worship. These cultic temple worship metaphors. And so sin is described as that which makes us unclean. It defiles us. It stains us. It perverts us. It corrupts us. Uh, by the way, you might be able to make the argument. You can't. 
trust. Well, we, we, we could have that debate. Uh, you might be able to make the argument that at least in regard to the legal metaphor, that all sin is the same in the eyes of God. You might be able to make that argument. You'd be wrong. But you might be able to make that argument. But the problem with sin is it's not just the breaking of the law of God. It is bringing harm in relationship. How many of you realize that some sins do greater harm than others in family dynamics? Do I hear an amen? Yeah. And sometimes that's in the eyes of God what makes some sins worse than others. Please hear me. Not all sin. What, what is it there? What is it? All sin separates us from God. Do you hear that sort of statement? Well, the answer to that is no. No. No, especially Wesleyans, you should know that. We make this distinction between a willful transgression and a transgression that is not willful. Please hear me, they're both sin. They're both sin, please hear me. They're both sin. But they don't equally separate us from God. Not, please hear me, how many of you heard that? I'm just saying, this is, again, this idea that all sin separates us from God. Um, is folk theology. It's folk theology. Uh, please hear me. Some sins are worse than other sins in God's eyes. And so even if sin does separate, it doesn't equally separate us. And you can see that in this familial level. On the familial level, some sins are more harmful than others. And then how many of you realize that when we begin to talk about being stained and, and perverted and, and corrupted and made impure, uh, some of us, some sins are worse than others in regard to the degree to which it defiles us, it makes us unclean, it corrupts us, it breaks us. Please, so please hear me. Not all sin is the same in the eyes of God. Not necessarily all sin separates us from God. Please hear me, even the sins that doesn't separate us from the love of God, I will say this, it still needs the atoning work of Jesus Christ applied to it. This is the reason why in the history of Christianity, we've always identified mortal sin. These sins as Christians that you must absolutely stay away from. Why? Because of what they do on a relational level and what they do in regard to corruption and what they do with perversion, impurity, what they do to yourself, and what they do to others as well. All right, so um, here's the problem. We have a legal problem with God. We've broken the law of God. Uh, we've also uh, experienced the, the, the separation and alienation and estrangement in varying ways and degrees that come as a result of sin. And then we've also experienced uh, various levels of brokenness and corruption and perversion in our own souls and lives and, and, and have corrupted others through our sins uh, a, as well. And so all of it has to be addressed. And so how is, how is this uh, addressed? And so you have these corresponding metaphors of salvation. These corresponding metaphors of salvation. And so uh, for the legal metaphors, how does God deal with the legal problem of sin? It's with the doctrine and with the reality and the work of justification. Justification is the forgiveness of our sins. No longer being guilty for the sins that we've committed against God and the things that we've been the, the things that we've committed against other people. We are justified in God's sight. But we're also we need more than justification. Please hear me. Justification in the end, while necessary, as I said before, is not enough to save us. And so we have a legal problem, but we also have a relational problem. And this is addressed through reconciliation, through adoption as the children of God. We are reconciled to God, and by being reconciled to God, we come into a reconciled community where we are reconciled to one another. But then... Uh, we must not only experience justification and adoption, reconciliation, but we must also be, can I use this language, cleaned up. 
This is the language of sanctification. So all are necessary. Here, uh, just a quick thought why we need all three. Uh, This is the problem. There are churches and actually denominations that have a tendency of focusing on one of these metaphors of sin. And whatever they focus in regard to their metaphor of sin, they will focus on the metaphor for salvation that corresponds with it. So, let me talk about the Wesleyan tradition just for a moment. Do you know the Wesleyan tradition has uh, really uh, focused on the corruption, perversion. We would call it original sin, the sin nature, the condition of sin. We've we've tended to focus on that in in the Wesleyan tradition. And so, because we've done that, salvation has been almost entirely at times been reduced to sanctification. It's been reduced to sanctification. So sometimes in the Wesleyan church, and it's not just the Wesleyan church, just to let you know I've been a part of some, please hear me, I'm not picking on our Baptist brothers and sisters, but I've seen this in the southern part of the United States with, uh, the, in Baptist church, it can be incredibly legalistic, that salvation is like walking a tightrope. And if I fall off that tightrope, in that moment, hell threatens me. But how many of you realize the problem with that, if you're so focused on sanctification, you lose sight of the truth of justification. And you lose sight of the truth of adoption. Some traditions, they're so focused on justification, the forgiveness of sins, the gospel gets simply reduced to that. There's such a focus on the forgiveness of sins that that's all that sin becomes. And that's all that redemption becomes. All you need to do is go to the altar, be baptized, profess your faith, and the deed is done. You're forgiven. You're justified. That's all that matters. Thanks God. Thank God you have your ticket to heaven. But there's more to the problem of sin than just a legal understanding. I think of my own tradition which is the United Methodist Church, uh, we've tended to focus on reconciliation, uh, the problem of sin being um, familial, relational, and therefore salvation has been tied simply to adoptive and reconciliation. So that at times in a more liberal denomination, you're going to always hear how much God loves you and wants to be in a relationship with you, and all the gospel gets reduced to that. Now, is that wrong? No. But it's not all of the truth. All three metaphors are necessary for both the understanding of the problem that we have in our world, as well as uh, all are necessary in regard to Uh, in regard to salvation and having a holistic view of the salvation that we have in Christ. Please hear me. Jesus has come in order that our sins might be atoned for, that we can be absolved of the guilt of sin. Please hear me that he has come in order that you might be reconciled to God and not only reconciled to God, but to true, please hear me, truly, please hear me, truly, please hear me, truly, please hear me, truly, Please hear me. (laughs) Truly, a son, a daughter of God. But, not just to be reconciled to God, not just to have our sins forgiven, but so that we can be truly transformed conformed to the image of Christ who is the image of God so that the image of God in us might be fully restored in us so that we can truly, truly begin to walk in what we talk about in our Wesleyan tradition in holiness. We can truly walk in the love of God and the love of neighbor. All right, that is salvation. If you would take just 
a minute. And based on a very quick discussion of salvation, question, insight, something you would agree with or disagree with. One of those things, a question or an insight, one thing you would agree with or disagree with and share with a neighbor. Here we are in our journey. Let's do it together. Can I see your hands? Here's where we are. God, creation, fall, redemption, and now we've come to the last point, consummation. The good thing about it is there's not much I can say here. There are a few things I can say that, that are critical. The reason why, there are a lot of the issues that are associated with consummation have been debated and are debated in Christians. And so trying to find a consensus in Christianity in regard to some of these issues is incredibly difficult. But I am going to try to identify what is clearly agreed upon in Scripture as we are reading it. So the first thing that I, I want to talk about, of course, is the doctrine of death. Before we can talk about the resurrection of the body, we've got to talk about death. And some of us are closer to death than others, <laughs> just by virtue of our age uh, in here. Uh, I, uh, just this uh, past semester, had a moment in which it crossed my mind, this could be it. Uh, this could be it for me. Uh, it was an interesting moment uh, <laughs> when you realize this could be it. But uh, when the scriptures talk about death, it talks about death in three ways. Three ways. First of all, it talks about physical death, which is a result of the fall in the garden. Physical death. It talks about spiritual death. The death that we suffer as a result of the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. Hence the need for us to be born again. Which falls under sanctification. Sanctification is when God actually does something in us. To change us. And that begins in new birth. Sometimes we call that initial sanctification. So uh, there is physical death. There's spiritual death. And then the scriptures talk about the second death. The second death or eternal death. Which is this ultimate and final hell. Ultimate and final hell. Next is second coming and resurrection. Here is the question, though, before I go there. The question is this. What exactly happens to us when we die? What happens to us when I die? Can I say this, that there are debates in Christians, among Christians, in Christian communities, about what exactly happens when we die. And part of the reason why that is, and hear me, we tend to be preoccupied what happens to ourselves when we die. Or what happens to our loved ones when we die. That is not the focus of the New Testament. The focus on the New Testament isn't about what happens when we die. But it's focused on second coming bodily resurrection. Our overcoming the state of death. So what happens when we die? There are two major ideas in the history of Christianity. Here is what I would call the majority view. The majority view does believe we have some sort of conscious existence when we die. A conscious existence in our, uh, with our souls. And for the righteous, that means that they experience what would be called the intermediate heaven. Not the final heaven, but the intermediate. To be in the presence of God, at rest in the presence of God, until Christ comes back. The, uh, for the unrighteous, it is for them to experience the intermediate hell. Not the final hell, not the ultimate hell, but the intermediate hell. So it is a disembodied conscious existence. That is the majority view. There is sort of a minority report, though, in regard to this. And it's called soul sleep. And it is the idea that we actually don't have a conscious existence between death and resurrection. We don't. Please hear me. This is the reason why, from a historic Christian perspective, you never really have a Christian funeral. 
you never really have a Christian funeral unless there is the mention, the affirmation of the hope. Our hope is not that when we die, our souls go to be with God. Our hope is that bodily death is overcome. That's our hope. Because to be human is to be, what have we said, an embodied soul. You're not a body without a soul, and you're not a soul without a body. How many of you, let me just be very clear, biblically and theologically, however it cuts, there, you aren't human if you don't have your body. You're only partially human. So whatever, even if we have a conscious existence in the intermediate state, you are not fully human. And even if your soul is at rest in God, I will tell you, sin and Satan and death have had the last word over your life. This is what Jesus, I mean, this is what Paul means in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul said, if Jesus Christ did not bodily rise again from the dead, our faith, our hope is in vain. Please hear me. You've heard me say it before. Uh, Paul doesn't mean that somehow the bodily resurrection proves that Jesus is God. Paul's point is if Christ did not bodily rise again from the dead, then we have no hope of bodily resurrection. And if we have no hope of our, our bodies being redeemed, then we have no hope at all. Salvation isn't the fact that you and I die and our souls go to be with God. That's Gnosticism. It's paganism. It's not Christianity. And so this is a reason why you may go to a funeral. I always tell this to my students because it's a pet peeve of mine. Because I go to, I've gone over the years to a number of funerals. And Jesus is mentioned many times in the funeral service. But there's never a mention of what our hope is. You see it very clearly in the liturgies that are at a committal service. It goes something like this, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. This body we commit to the ground, this soul we commend to God, awaiting, awaiting, awaiting the day of the resurrection. The resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. So when is the resurrection of the body uh, going to take place? It's going to happen at the second coming of Jesus. Now you can read a lot of books. And I tell you, I get, I get a lot of uh, unsolicited books and manuscripts that tell me they've got this all figured out. But all the circumstances surrounding the second coming of Jesus. Please hear me. Jesus Christ is coming again. We affirm that. Jesus is coming again, and he's physically coming again. Christ is coming in his humanity again. And when he comes, he will set all things right when he comes. But there are disagreements, and I could go into this. There's premillennialism, there's postmillennialism, there's amillennialism, and uh, then there's something that is called uh, premillennial dispensationalism uh, that apparently has got this all figured out. Uh, the Schofield Reference uh, Bible, and, and if you read the Left Behind series, uh, please hear me, that's not to, 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 to denigrate those, but you could read those and think they've got it all figured out. Uh, please hear me, nobody's got it figured out. There's been no consensus in Christianity in regard to the circumstances surrounding the second coming of Jesus. But he is coming back again. He is coming back, and we live in anticipation of that. Uh, uh, by the way, um, some people call this a pan-millennialism. It'll all pan out in the end. You've heard that before. I just had to sneak, uh, sneak that in. Uh, on a personal level, um, I really do believe, I really do believe that, um, well, you don't want to know what I believe in regard to that, but I, I live in the expectancy of the imminent return of, uh, of Christ. I live in that expectancy. All right, Christ is going to come back. And then uh, when Christ uh, comes back, there is the resurrection of the dead. Please hear me. This is the resurrection of the righteous and the unrighteous. 
It is the resurrection of everyone. And uh, there will be final judgment in which we will stand before Christ. But we'll stand before Jesus, not apart from the Father and not apart from the Spirit. But we will stand before Christ and give an account of our lives. Uh, please hear me. Uh, our sins are forgiven, our trespasses, but we're still going to have to give an account of the gifts and graces and the light that God has given to us. We will stand before God and give to God. But please hear me, as Christian, as adopted, we stand before Christ as Christ as being our brother, our Savior, and our Lord. Uh, to use the language of John Wesley, the people of God stand before Christ in final judgment with a, uh, a, a filial fear and not a servile fear. The fear of a child. The fear of a son. The fear of a daughter who's going before a beloved in the midst of that. But we will stand before him and we will give final judgment. And then, as you know, uh, left, right, sheep, goat, cursed, not cursed. How many of you remember this? Oh, oh, I love this song I learned uh, when I was uh, first a Christian. And uh, it goes like this. I, want to say, I bet you know it as well. I don't want to be a goat. Nope. I don't want to be a goat. Nope. Because a goat ain't got no hope. Nope. I don't want to be a goat, nope. I just want to be a sheep, bah. I just want to be a sheep, bah. From my head down to my feet, yah. I just want to be a sheep, bah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just couldn't. That's one of my all-time favorite children uh, songs. <laughs> this is the separation. And then there is eternity, life everlasting. Amen. And there's life everlasting in hell and life everlasting in the ultimate heaven. And uh, let me just say one thing about hell here. Uh, please hear me. A lot of people, and I'm not saying it's wrong, it's just the attitude towards it. Uh, please hear me. I have a healthy fear of hell. Uh, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want anybody to go to hell. And consensual Christianity sees hell being eternal. But sometimes we get so fixated on the images of fire and burning and brimstone that we miss the true hell of hell. And the true hell of hell is to never realize What we've been created for. It's made in the image of God. To be the glory of God in creation. To love God with all heart, soul, mind and strength. To give ourselves in self-giving love to God. Self-giving love to one another. The true hell of hell. Is to live a life. In estrangement and alienation from God. That is the hell of hell. Now, I, I will say this. That doesn't sound too bad. Unless you know what it is to be reconciled to God and in relationship with Him. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine anything worse in existence than that. Hell. But we don't end on hell. We end on heaven. It is the consummation of all things. And uh, uh, please hear me, it is not a doing away of this world, but it's a transformation of creation. That which God has created, God does not destroy, but he brings it to the ultimate purposes for which it is created. So the end is for us to be brought fully into the life of God, of which we only have a foretaste in this life of what that will be. And it's not just us being brought fully and participating in the life of God, but it is also all of creation being brought into and participating in the life of God. Please hear me, in heaven you and I will not cease being human. But we will be fully realized as human beings. 
And we will realize to the fullest extent and ever increasing degrees of glory. What it is to be the image and the glory of God in creation. Maranatha, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.